Today we're going to be talking about the NADC 3050. <laughs> Edit. The unit that I'm reviewing is the NADC 3050 with Blue OS. And the retail price for this is about 1800 bucks. The standard unit that doesn't come with Blue OS is about 1400 bucks, 1300 bucks, somewhere in that ballpark depending on where you find it. The main difference here is that the Blue OS gives you two big things. One is streaming, so you can stream wirelessly, Tidal, Cobuzz, I think you can do Apple Music through AirPlay 2, some of the other things among uh, that realm. But for me, the other benefit that you're really paying for is Direct Live. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more shortly. I actually received this on loan from NAD directly to review. I'm not getting paid, I'm not keeping it, but I really would like to. I mean, I'm, I'm really considering maybe still buying it anyway, but I don't need it, that's the problem. Anyway, this, this is probably one of the best looking integrated units that I've seen. Probably bar none. I think most of you know that I really like Macintosh. But I just like the classic aesthetic of this. It has the little wattage meters on here too, which are super duper cool. It has tons of inputs and outputs. Everything from HDMI eARC for playing television through it. Two digital inputs, a Toslink and a coaxial. Stereo RCA inputs and a phono input as well. You also have RCA pre-outs. So if you wanted to connect separate amplifier or another set of mono block amplifiers, you could do that. This also has a subwoofer pre-out, which when you engage it, enables both the subwoofer pre-outs, low pass filter, and it sets the high pass filter for your mains automatically. So as you adjust through the app, the crossover frequency, that adjusts the high pass filter as well as the low pass filter for the mains and then the subwoofer. Another feature that this has is kind of neat is it has A and B speaker outs. So maybe you want to power a different set of speakers somewhere else in your house. You could do that concurrently. Alternatively, which I kind of played around with was A, B testing speakers. So let's say that you bought this preamp, you really like it, but you can't decide on what speakers you want to buy. You can hook both sets up to this preamp and then just toggle between which speakers you want to listen to and kind of go back and forth. Maybe shut your eyes and, and toggle a whole lot or have somebody else toggle and see what speaker you like the most and then send the other one back. It is a Class D amplifier and I know that some people are really reticent to purchase Class D amplifiers in the audio file or the hi-fi audio file world. Listen, I've been running Class D amplifiers since, I don't know, 2008, something like that. I've never really had an issue. The only issue that I've ever had was floor noise. And with this amplifier, using standard sensitivity speakers at about 10 feet away, and when I say standard sensitivity, I'm talking around 85 to 88 decibels sensitivity, real sensitivity, not bullcrap numbers from a manufacturer who always adds six or 12 decibels to their values. We know who they are. In doing that, I didn't have any noise issues. There's no hiss coming through the speakers that I noticed, even when sitting up right next to the speakers. Now it's possible, theoretically, that if you were trying to power a very highly sensitive set of pro audio speakers through this amplifier, then maybe you're gonna get some noise and I'm only leaving that on the floor because it's possible, but I didn't have that issue at all. This is rated for 100 watts by two channels, and it actually does that with both channels powered at the exact same time. You'll see that in my tests. That rating is for four ohm and eight ohm. It's not rated for two ohm, and I did not test it for two ohm. A couple other features that I like is that this has bass and treble knobs, so you can adjust the bass or treble, and in my case, I actually played around with the treble adjustment a few times with some of the speakers that I've had in for review over the past month. There's also an amplifier section for headphones. So if you wanna hook up some headphones to this, you can do that, I didn't. And of course, this does have Bluetooth enabled if you wanna do that. Now, so that's something that I didn't do. I'm not saying Bluetooth is bad, I just didn't use that feature in this particular unit. I did, however, use the app, which connects through Bluetooth a lot. I use the Blue OS app, as well as the Direct Live app. And speaking of Direct Live, this has Direct Live built in, but Direct Live is only enabled for 20 hertz to 500 hertz. Now, the thing about Direct Live is it is an automatic room EQ 
software. You use a microphone, you place the microphone where it tells you to place it, and then it will measure the response of each of your speakers one at a time. And then based off of multiple measurements, it will determine the best filters in order to smooth out the response. And once you do that, assuming you've done it correctly, which honestly is not very hard to do, just follow the on-screen instructions via your app, which I'm showing here, then you have the choice of adjusting the level that Dirac is going to correct. In my situation, I chose two different levels, just kind of playing around to see which one I like more. And here are the results from just one setting with Dirac Live on versus off. Right now, it's just Dirac Live turned off. This is the in-room response at my main listening position about 10 feet away in an 18 by 14 by nine foot room. Let's ignore the upper frequency response because Direct doesn't control anything above about 500 Hertz. This is its cutoff. So it's 500 Hertz and below. You can see that there's a peak around 50 Hertz in the room and then another peak around 150, 160 Hertz or so, like right in this region. Now what Direct Live is going to do is it's gonna sweep, it's gonna measure, it's gonna build filters, and it's gonna to try to fix some of the response as best it can, but it's not gonna fix everything. This is the result. And you can see that there's about at 150 hertz, 50 decibels versus 53, about three decibels difference. And then 55 versus 58, maybe another three decibels or so difference at 50 hertz. You know, in general, what this has done then, it is that smooth out the response again, as best it can. This is a room issue and Dirac can only do so much, but the fixes that it did make helped the mid bass area quite a bit. Now I could have had it do more tests. I could have had it do more aggressive filtering if I'd have chosen to done that in the software via my app. But this was just an example of what it's able to do. In terms of how that sounded, Direct Lab is worth the money. It, and if you're worried about 500 Hertz being the cap, just a quick crash course in sound in rooms. Sound in rooms the speaker pretty much dictates what you're going to hear above around 500 hertz. So there's a reason that they chose this number. Now, of course, it's going to be room size dependent, but for most domestic rooms, you're around 400 to 600 hertz. It's kind of the transition region known as the Schroeder frequency, where the sound from the speaker is really dominating what you're hearing. And then the room as you go below about 500 Hertz is dominating what you hear. The dimensions of the room are really driving the response and the lower frequency you go, the more the dimensions of the room are, are really your culprit. Above about 500 Hertz, it's the speaker. So it's positioning of the speaker, it's aiming of the speaker, it's where you sit, are you sitting at the right axis? Are your ears at the tweeter level or do they need to be below that? How is the speaker itself designed? What's the off-axis response? What's the on-axis response? What's the radiation pattern of the speaker? 500 hertz and up, that's the speaker. 500 hertz and below, that's room, 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 more, more room. And that's why this particular piece only controls up to 500 hertz. Now, there is the option to buy the full Dirac Live setup if you want to, but I, my honest opinion is buy a good speaker, let the speaker dictate the sound in the room above 500 hertz, and then use Direct Live that comes with this below 500 hertz, and let that fix the room problems. I talked about the app a minute ago, so I'm gonna come back to that. The thing that I like about the app is that you can set up subwoofer control. You can actually enable and disable Direct Live. So once you've ran Direct Live, then you have multiple settings that you can choose to store this into, and I think there's up to four. The subwoofer crossover is, again, it's built into the app, so you can just pick where your subwoofer is going to be crossed over at. Remember, it's linked to the high pass filter for the mains. And it also allows you to set stereo mode or mono mode and play around with the mixing down and mixing up, if you will, except you can't go beyond stereo. So now let's talk about sound. How did this amplifier sound? Well, to me, the NAD C3050 sounds sweet. It sounds buttery smooth. It really has great chocolatey bass. 
It has texture, realism, high resolution, detail, inner detail, inner fidelity, inner sanctum, inner sanctuary, inner belly button, inner ear, inner loaf, inner twine. Oh, sorry. I was just thinking of all these words that I can use and forgot which ones are real and which ones are actually applicable. So the truth of the matter is that this amplifier doesn't have a sound characteristic. And that's what you want, guys. You don't want an amplifier. Well, speaking for the majority of people, you don't want the amplifier to color the sound. You don't want the amplifier to be terribly load dependent. You don't want to have to worry about, is this speaker going to sound different with this amplifier than it is with this amplifier? So in this case, you'll see this in the measurements, the load, as long as it's within four ohm, doesn't alter the response of this amplifier. In other words, the amplifier isn't gonna say, you've given me some really odd impedance load and I don't know what to do with it, so now I'm changing the frequency response of what you're going to hear. Some amplifiers, that actually happens. The Weem amplifier that I just reviewed, which is a little $300 deal, not even the same class as this thing, it's, it's on its own for the right reasons, but it is somewhat load dependent and some of the frequency response variations that are measurably, objective measurably there can be audible. But in this particular case with this amplifier, it doesn't have any of that. It meets rated power and actually goes a little bit above that. It doesn't have a high noise floor, at least that I could tell through my listening. And it powers the speakers that I was using about three or four different sizes, sizes uh, and different sensitivities from about 85 decibels to 88 decibels in my room, at my listening position, 10 feet away, room size 18, 14, nine feet. Plenty loud. In fact, too loud. It was adequate. I didn't need more power than the power that this amplifier provides. Now, if you are in a larger room or you have the desire to go louder or you sit further away, then 100 watts might not be adequate for you. I would say that for the vast majority, and this is based off experience, the vast majority of people are gonna be more than fine with 100 watts for their mains. Now let's transition over to something different that you're probably not used to seeing from other reviewers. If you're new to electronics measurements, at least on this channel, that would be data. So I'm gonna show you some, what I consider sanity check data to give you an idea of the objective performance of this amplifier does it meet rated power. Now, I don't have the utilities to go super deep level into some of the measurements that I wish I could. So for that, there are websites such as Stereophile and Soundstage Network. Both of those sites have reviewed this particular item. I encourage you to go there and do further research into more objective measurements. But again, this is more top shelf, just sanity checking things to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. We're gonna start with the frequency response where I measured two static loads, a four ohm and an eight ohm load, as well as two reactive loads, which are done to simulate a real loudspeaker. Now I can't test a real loudspeaker at certain levels because it would just cause me to go deaf or potentially damage the speaker. These reactive loads are to give us an idea of what would happen if you hooked up a typical speaker. All of these graphics look pretty much the same. There is some very minor deviation in the complex load, which is in orange, compared to the eight ohm and the four ohm load. There's a little bit of deviation in the simple load, but remember the scale here is plus three decibels, minus three decibels. You're talking about a 10th of a decibel, if that. If you can hear that, you've got Superman hearing. You've got the kind of hearing that when people are anywhere near you, you're gonna go out of your mind. Kind of like that scene from What Women Want where Mill Gibson just lost his mind because he started hearing all the women's thoughts. That would be you if you could hear one-tenth of a decibel difference in this amplifier. This is the subwoofer crossover. I believe you can set it at a minimum of 40 hertz and a maximum of 200 hertz. You can see that it blends at the negative six dB point. Just like you have to have a hoverboard, a powered hoverboard to go over water, you have to have a powered amplifier to power your speakers. That was a stretch. All right, so what I've got here is the power versus THD, and it just gives us an idea of when are you hitting the limits of this amplifier. At eight ohm, it's about 130 watts, and at four ohm, it's about 170 watts. In my last review of an electronic piece, which was the Weem Amp, 
one of the complaints that people had was that the power just didn't seem like it was adequate. So what I thought I would do in that test was to test with the same input voltage for one tone, what is that power output? And then multi-tone with the same input voltage, what is that power output? Now they should be the same, single tone versus multi-tone. It really shouldn't matter. In that particular test, what I found was that at full output, there was about a 30 watt or so degradation between one tone versus multi-tone, which means that if you're playing one tone, sure, you could get 100 watts. If you're playing a whole bunch of tones at one time, it actually capped out at 30 watts less. So let's see what happens with this NADC3050. The first thing I'm doing is a sanity check. With one tone, what am I getting? With this input voltage right here, I'm getting roughly two watts, 1.92. So now what happens when I apply the same input voltage but with a multi-tone signal? Pretty much the exact same, 1.94 watts. Now let's try this one tone at rated power, which is 100 watts at four ohm. Here's 100 watts, and this is the input voltage that I need to get that. Taking that same input voltage, but using a multi-tone signal, what power do I get? 97 watts, 98 watts. So I'm about three to two watts off of the rated power that I just achieved using one tone. I think that's pretty good. In other words, it seems to me like this amplifier is perfectly capable of providing all the output that you need and its power supply isn't sagging in order to do so, even when driven hard with a bunch of tones at a four ohm load. All of these measurements will be on my website at aaronsaudiocorner.com, which I'll also include in the description box below. That wraps it up for this review. All in all, this is a fantastic integrated amp. It looks awesome. I love that it has direct live, even though you're paying extra for that, but at the same time, you're getting the streaming built in as well. You don't have to get the streaming and direct live version. You can save about four or 500 bucks by getting the more standard one. And that's really the only difference are those two features. But in my opinion, if you're looking for hi-fi sound, which if you're buying this amplifier, you probably are trying to build you a nice little hi-fi system, spend that extra money, get you direct live, and it will transform your experience to something that I promise you will love. There are a lot of people who do not like to EQ pure stereo systems. Don't be one of those guys because you really can benefit from proper equalization in the low frequency area. Don't touch the high frequencies. Let your speakers do their thing, but fix what the room is destroying in the low bass region. All right, that's my sales pitch for that. Speaking of sales pitches, yes. If you want to support this channel, I would certainly appreciate it. You can do so two different ways. One would be at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. You can join me there for behind the scenes info, early releases for these videos and other reviews. A second way you can do that would be to follow my generic affiliate links, which I'll have in the description as well. But I will also have an affiliate link directly to this amplifier to Crutchfield. So if you want to buy it that way, that earns me a small commission, doesn't cost you anything extra. It doesn't bias my review. I've reviewed plenty of things and I said I didn't like. I've still provided an affiliate link and sometimes people still buy it. My thinking is if you wanna buy it, why not let you do it through my affiliate link? Because seriously, it helps me. It helps me afford lunch, do fun stuff with my daughter, or just, you know, do other cool things. Blah, 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 I appreciate it. Please consider using that affiliate link. With all of that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care, peace.